I want to thank Sandy Magnus for uh, and you and the AIAA team for inviting me to come out. I've tried to do this for a number of years, and so it's really special to be here this time. Um, I've had an opportunity to participate with you all uh, frequently on the East Coast uh, activities, but it's just difficult to get out here, and it happened that I was able to present uh, the George M. Lowe Award to a small business enterprise out of San Diego, ATA Engineering, yesterday. It caused me to be at JPL, looked at the schedule, said, boy, this is a great time to come down to LA and be with AIAA. So it's, it's glad to be, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I, I think the video that we just viewed provides a pretty quick look at the issues behind a new strategic vision that's driving the many exciting things NASA is doing today in aeronautics. Um, and this is, uh, I, I really love to talk about this topic. Um, when Jim came in, Jim Albaugh down here came in, he said, hey, you're going to talk about human spaceflight today. I said, not on your life. I said, I want to talk about aeronautics. I don't get to talk about aeronautics nearly enough, and I'm always challenging Jay Wan Shen, who heads our aeronautics mission directorate, to go find venues when we can talk about NASA aeronautics. I would love to see you all be more active than you are. Now, you probably say, what is he talking about? We do all kinds of stuff. Well, if I got half the pressure from this community uh, that I get from one congressman on going to a distant planet, uh, we'd be okay. We really would. Uh, I think most of you know that NASA's budget uh, is not tiny, uh, but the aeronautics portion of it is minuscule. It's, uh, it's, less than a it's less than a billion, less than a half, it is about a half billion dollars. It's eh, in the neighborhood of 560 or so million dollars, and all the things you saw in that video, all the things you see and do in your community uh, comes from, from that small amount of money. Just imagine what we could do as a nation uh, and as an industry if we had another hundred million. I mean, just think about it. A hundred million dollars. Uh, that, that doesn't even begin to, I can't buy toilet paper for the human spaceflight community with a hundred million dollars. Mike, Mike Griffin sitting down here is smiling, but he knows that's true. You know, we have expensive toilet paper in the human space flight community. Uh, I don't even need toilet paper in aeronautics most of the time, unless you fly like I do, and then you may need it now and then. I, uh, people always ask me, you know, do you miss, do you miss being in, in, the, in the astronaut office? Do you miss flying in space? And I tell them, no, I don't. Um, I get nostalgic sometimes. Uh, I used to when we were still flying shuttle and I would go to a launch, I'd go to a landing, um, but I, I don't miss it. Uh, I miss the people, to be quite honest, uh, but when I see anything that has to do with an airplane, uh, particularly the low boom activities, you know, when you see the contrails and you see an F-18 and you know this guy's really having a ball. Uh, they're really hanging it out there. Or you think back on times that you figured, okay, this is it. I'm not going to make it out of this one. I really got myself in an, in, a, in an S sandwich here, and I don't know how to get out of this. And then miraculously, you manage to get your hands in the right place on the controls, and the airplane recovers from the, from the dorky thing you just did. Uh, that I do miss, believe it or not. Uh, it's just going out and, and being able to, to have the freedom of moving uh, and, and a machine around, around the air the way that we do in aviation. You know, we like to say that NASA is with you when you fly. I don't know about you, but, but I fly a lot. Um, I fly around the world quite a bit. It's not always pleasant, but I'm glad that the innovations NASA has helped drive there are to make us better and safer. I'm grateful that we have so many opportunities to do things today that we couldn't when I first took my seat behind the controls in a cockpit, or even years later, when I piloted a space shuttle to orbit. Here on Earth, civil and general aviation accounts for eh, roughly $1.3 trillion of U.S. economic activity annually. Air travelers spend around $636 billion, that's with a B, three, $636 billion in the U.S. economy, and more than 10.2 million direct and indirect jobs are generated by aviation. And whether or not you flew today, something you needed did. About 1.5 trillion in freight, trillion dollars in freight is shipped every year by air. Those are some big numbers. They mean a lot to the economic and cultural health of our country, and that's why we do what we do. But beyond whether or not I got my upgrade yesterday, and I did, fortunately, I don't get it going back, but I, I, you know, it was a good enough flight few enough people, so I got an upgrade. 
since Mike left, he told him I couldn't fly first class. So uh, Mike didn't do that. He did the same thing. Um, but today in aeronautics, we've looked at the big picture, how aviation fits into a global picture of incredible economic and population expansion in certain parts of the world and technological innovation everywhere. What we see has led us to an exciting new strategic vision for NASA aeronautics. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Today, NASA aeronautics research agenda is focused on substantially reducing fuel consumption, emissions and noise to make the next generation air transportation system or next gen a reality. And looking ahead, we also are tackling emerging challenges likely to cha change the face of aviation during the next 20 to 40 years. One of our key research goals is safe, efficient growth in global operations, and we've been working on air traffic management tools to reduce delays, with the secondary benefit of helping reduce aviation's impact on the environment. The, the phrase, timing is everything, means something very specific to pilots and astronauts. Precision is everything. The complexity of air traffic control reminds me of the shuttle countdown which required complicated procedures and teamwork to get off the ground at just the right time to reach our slot in the sky, which is even more difficult if you're trying to rendezvous with the International Space Station. We don't launch all around the clock because we like random launch times. I've heard that the Gemini astronauts describe rendezvous and docking timing as one guy on a merry-go-round tossing a ball to another guy on another merry-go-round. So timing is everything. So it's very timely that today I'm able to announce the latest example of NASA and the FAA working together to enhance safety and efficiency in the nation's airspace. NASA has just handed off to the FAA a new next-gen software tool that will improve the flow of aircraft from runways to cruising altitudes. Just last week, the tool developed by NASA called Precision Departure Release Capability, or PDRC, was transferred to the FAA for further development and implementation. This marks the third time in the past two years our two agencies have collaborated on the development of new technologies to enable aircraft to fly more efficiently, easing congestion in the nation's skies and reducing aviation's impact on the environment. PDRC was developed after an extensive analysis of aircraft operations showed that an uncertainty in precise departure times due to factors such as bad weather and heavy traffic may result in missed opportunities for those flights to efficiently merge into the flow of high altitude traffic. PDRC accurately predicts both the departure times and departure runways. This information is automatically sent to en route, en route centers where PDRC provides ascent trajectories from takeoff to the merge point in the high altitude traffic stream. PDRC can help us to fill up to 80% of the slots in high altitude flow that would otherwise go empty due to timing issues. It can complement the technologies and procedures already being used by the FAA to manage traffic flow and ease delays through each phase of flight. One of my colleagues has a great way to explain just what PDRC can do. He talks about how when he heads out of Washington, he tries to get on Interstate 395 to get to 495 so that he gets to 66 West to hit the HOV lanes and ideally get behind a tractor trailer and in front of an 86 Mazda. Think of those vehicles as the equivalent of aircraft in the overhead flow of traffic. That's the plan anyway. He said with PDRC, we, not, we would know exactly when he has to back out of the driveway in order to get from 395 to 495 to 66 West and be on the HOV lane to end up behind the tractor trailer and in front of the 86 Mazda. And my apologies to any of you who drive an 86 Mazda, but I, I think you get the idea. We're proud of this work and it's part of a larger integrated strategy of strategic goals and research that will advance our work to make this planet healthier and improve lives. Those are really the underpinnings of everything we do at NASA and in aeronautics, the person on the street really has the chance to see it impact their daily lives. The world is changing fast, we all know that. If you've been around a few decades like me, you've seen new technologies snapped up and adopted so quickly that within a generation, young people can't even contemplate what it was like, for instance, not to have a mobile phone or access to the internet 
let alone color TV. Let's face it, even watching programs on an actual television is not really their thing anymore. It's hard to remember a time when taking a flight across the country was a big deal, rarely done, and we hadn't yet walked on the moon. But we don't want our legacy to be legacy systems. We want to be at the bold anticipatory edge. We know a lot about trends in population growth in the other areas of the world. We are quite aware of emerging nations grabbing hold of technologies and making them their own. In this global environment, the U.S. not only needs to innovate to lead, we need to innovate to drive change that helps our economy stay aligned with our values regarding the environment. For U.S. aviation companies to compete, to compete and to sell, they must look beyond our shores and focus on nothing less than transforming air transportation, transforming mobility, to maintain current levels of business while striving to lead and innovate in meaningful ways. The new NASA aeronautics strategy, strategic vision is designed to meet the near-term challenges of a global air transportation system. We want, in the long term, to make that system truly sustainable and ultimately to transform aviation. We built our foundation on understanding emerging global trends, identifying the mega drivers for aviation that result from those trends, and focusing research on areas that respond to those drivers. We looked, for instance, at how traditional measures of global demand for mobility, such as economic development and urbanization, are growing rapidly. We looked at how severe energy and climate issues create enormous challenges for affordability and sustainability. We took into account how revolutions in automation, information and communications technologies bring new opportunities for safe and autonomous systems. This is the big picture framework on which we've built our aeronautics strategy. We're now aligning our programs, our program activities and, and investments toward progress in six research and technology themes or thrusts. Safe, efficient growth in global operations, including next gen and technologies to improve safety. Innovation in commercial supersonic aircraft, including work at lowering sonic boom impacts. Ultra efficient commercial transports, including pioneering technologies for big leaps in efficiency and lessening environmental impacts. Transition to low carbon propulsion and alternative fuels. Real-time system-wide safety assurance with emphasis on new integrated monitoring technology. And finally, breakthroughs in autonomy with high impact applications. I can't go into great detail in this forum on every one of these, but my Associate Administrator of NASA's Aeronautics Mission Directorate, Jaywan Shen, who's sitting right down here on the front row, and his staff, many of whom are here, have been living and breathing this stuff for a long time. Jay and many of his folk are, also, are here with us today, and I hope you've had an opportunity to hear from and talk with them over the course of this conference. And I understand there's still a day left, so don't, don't lose the opportunity. But let me take, for example, climate change, an issue that cuts across disciplines and boundaries and affects all of us. Talk about our work there. Sustainability is one of the key principles here. We've been working on environmentally friendly aircraft technologies and advanced future designs that dramatically reduce fuel use, noise, and emissions. I think, of all, I think, of, I think all of us feel the imperative to protect our planet. I know my perspective changed when I flew to space and saw the beautiful and the beauty and fragility of Earth and the lack of boundaries except those made by nature. But going green has to be more than a, than a catchphrase. We're talking about reducing environmental impact enough that the increased air traffic we know is coming will be sustainable. We must take care of our planet and in the process figure out how to use less fuel and more alternative fuels and generate less emissions and noise. As many of you know, after six years, NASA and its partners concluded flight tests of the X-48 blended wing body test aircraft. The team accomplished the goal of establishing a ground to flight database and provide, proved the low speed controllability of the concept throughout the flight envelope. Basically, this tailless craft with top mounted engines performed typical flight maneuvers at takeoff, cruise, and landing speeds. 
The aircraft shows promise for meeting all of NASA's environmental goals for future aircraft designs, such as 70% reduction in emissions during cruise, 50% reduction in fuel use, and reduction in community noise by at least a half. Low carbon propulsion and alternative fuels are going to be crucial as well. Our access, ground, and flight test demonstrations are helping airlines. The FAA and other government agencies understand how alternative aviation fuels affect jet engine operation and what burning these fuels does to the environment. Early data from the flight test indicate that the alternate, alternate fuel blend has no significant in, in effect on gaseous emissions, but it reduces black carbon emissions by more than 30 percent, both on the ground and at altitude cruise conditions. But none of that will matter if our planes aren't safe. Our real-time system-wide safety assurances work includes data mining, predictive tools, and ongoing work toward a future potential instantaneous safety system for aviation. NASA has taken data searches to a whole new level. We create unique computational tools that comb through trillions of pieces of aircraft data to identify issues before they become incidents. In 2008, Southwest Airlines began using NASA data mining tools to automatically analyze flight recorder output from 7,200 flights uncovering opportunities for operational improvements. Southwest has incorporated data mining software into daily operations and has since used other NASA-derived techniques and programs to improve navigation procedures, fuel efficiency, and track mile, track mile savings. NASA data mining tools are also being added to vehicle health management software used in some business jets and commercial aircraft. They alert ground maintenance personnel at the first sign of abnormal performance in engines and other aircraft components, making it possible to take corrective action long before warning lights are triggered and reducing maintenance delays at the departure gate. As with PDRC, we continue to transfer other technologies to the FAA for wider application, such as Efficient Descent Advisor, which was transferred last year. That technology has potential to reduce local noise and emissions pollution, reduce flight time, and save $300 million per year in wasted fuel. We've also made recent breakthroughs in supersonics. I've created a few sonic booms myself, and I know we're going to realistically have the high-speed aircraft that create them flying over land. We're going to have to lessen their degree of annoyance to the people on the ground. Then there's looking to how technologies that are revolutionizing under other industries might do the same if applied to aviation, like smart materials, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, information technology, embedded micro or nano sensors. NASA already works in some of these areas, but the leaps and bounds advances in other parts of the economy could move us along even faster. Like what we could add to our work by knowing more about the autonomous technologies in the self-driving Google car, or hybrid electric options for propulsion. It's really something of a renaissance time when you look at all the things we're working on and all the potential for breakthroughs that are right in front of us today. I know NASA will continue to be at the forefront of these breakthroughs, but we must use our limited resources wisely to have the most impact possible. That's what this new aeronautics vision is all about. We don't have to choose between safety and energy efficiency, between environment and innovation. What we can choose is transformation over more of the same, as our work in many areas converges and supports overlapping areas. The proof is already on every airplane today. I can't describe each and every technology from, from which every air traveler benefits but they include the continuing evolution of stronger and lighter composites, winglets to improve efficiency, chevron nozzles to reduce noise, improved air traffic management technologies, and much more. People may have a vision of the future that has astronauts setting foot on new worlds, and that's certainly in our playbook. But the way we travel and get around our home planet is as much a visionary leap into tomorrow as anything. We may not be looking at flying cars like the Jetsons, not just yet, but I believe people will be even more amazed at how their air travel system is going to change and evolve to serve their needs 
while also supporting our global goals for cleaner energy and good jobs. Aeronautics is part of NASA's name, but we don't know everything. We're counting on you to help us ask the right questions and help aviation meet the needs of the future. We need your feedback and your comments, your participation. Government can often do the big picture things that no single industry player can. But we also have to remain sensitive to our limited budgets and focus on the areas of most critical need and highest chances of success and impact. Your interaction with us is essential. None of us is, as they say, flying solo here. As we work on those big picture goals, we'll be striving to deliver high payoff technologies in the near term as well. All of you here today are creating the world of tomorrow. As fascinating, as groundbreaking, and innovative as anything we do in space. And I thank you for your dedication, your commitment, and innovation as we all embrace the future of flight. Now, I am happy to take your questions in some of the time that we have remaining. Thank you. And, and I am told that this crowd doesn't really need a mic, but, but they would encourage you to go to the mic in the center aisle there if you have a question because I think we're trying to carry this on NASA TV and, and they're also recording it for, for posterity so they can give it to your grandchildren and say, did he really ask that question? So. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your talk. I'm Terry Thompson from Airbus ProSky. Uh, you mentioned climate, and you mentioned what we all know is a very complex issue regarding the impacts of aviation on climate. But in the spirit of feedback and challenging questions that you just mentioned, there is another consideration, and that's the effect of climate on aviation, the reverse. So uh, there is evidence that certainly ground infrastructure uh, and possibly uh, turbulence, clear air turbulence in particular, uh, will increase, for example. So could you comment uh, on insights on this reverse effect, uh, climate upon aviation? Well, I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. If you look at systems that we're developing today, we continue to look for predictive uh, sensors on board that help crews see uh, have clear air turbulence, say, tens of miles out front. Um, those are some of the things we're looking at. Uh, I, I just think that we will continue to work collaboratively with uh, industry, academia, uh, and others to come up with some of the systems that you're talking about that will help aviation overcome or live with the, uh, the environment that, that is evolving. Uh, the example you gave is excellent. I, I think we burbled all the way out here from Washington, D.C., from, from Dulles. And it was, every time I fly today, uh, it seems like it is much more intense and much more frequent, uh, you know, than ever before. So we, we do have to, we've got to get, get a step on to develop some systems that help, help crews in that regard. They Thank can't keep, you know, searching by climbing and descending until you find a, a safe location. Systems like LIDAR and others, I think, may help us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to come out and speak with us today. Uh, you mentioned the, the dream of uh, personal door-to-door -door mobility, and uh, the, the center at, at Langley has been doing incredible pioneering work on uh, efficient electric VTOL, uh, and uh, now that's, that's spread out into this industry, and there's more and more companies focused on uh, creating the, the dream of maybe not the flying car, but at least the, the, the vertical takeoff, and pers efficient personal VTOL. Uh, how do you see NASA's role expanding in that, uh, in that arena? I think our primary role, and it, it, as I said, we don't know everything. We don't have the corner of the market on ideas. I heard about a challenge. I, who was it I was talking with just, just before I came up here? I learned about a challenge now to introduce you know, the fact that, okay, we have short, very short runways. We want to develop systems that can get off these very short runways 
and into flight. We're big on challenges and prizes, and I think what we have to do is collaborate with, with organizations and people who have these ideas. Uh, that's, that's where government can really help by providing the backing, the financial backing for challenges and prizes that help industry, academia, just the general populace for coming up with great ideas uh, that will help us in an area like you mentioned there. That, that's fantastic. Thank you. I, yeah. I think the prizes are a, a, a very wonderful way to, to drive innovation and, and uh, so I commend you for, for that. Thank you. I, I will say, you know, when I talked about earlier, I have to be careful here so that I'm not lobbying for anything, but um, what we do does require funds, funding. And, uh, and as I said, $100 million, for example, is a lot of money in, in what we do. Uh, it's a lot of challenges, a lot of prizes, a lot of very small initiatives, low boom that's going on out at Dryden. Uh, those are not incredibly expensive initiatives. Um, we also have to help people understand the value of, of what it is that we get excited about. The fact that hypersonic flight is critical to the nation that rotary wing research, the continuation of rotary wing research is critical to the nation. Um, back where I come from, you know, in and around DC, you will be, you'd be surprised at how, how infrequently those topics are discussed. I think they're national security issues uh, and we tend to work them inside NASA. Um, you know, and sometimes we're fortunate enough that we have an opportunity to partner with you all in industry. But, but these are things that you and the aviation community know are important, and we just need, we need for you to help tell that story. Uh, you know, NASA can't do it all in that regard. So you would like us to spend more time on Capitol Hill? I'm not saying that. Okay. <laughs> Thank but you I don't much. object to anything that the industry, that, that, the, that the community does. I, uh, there is a saying, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, you know, we spend a lot of, I spend a lot of time uh, on things that, while they may be important, uh, they're not going to change the course of history or, or the future of humanity, but we spend a lot of time talking about them. Aviation, aeronautics, and its development and advancement will. And, uh, and I just don't spend enough, I think, I don't spend enough time having uh, what I call intellectual discussions. You know how many hearings I've had on aeronautics? I've, I've now been the NASA administrator for an, almost a well, a little over four years. You know how many hearings I've had on aeronautics? Zero. Zero. Mike, how many did you have? Yeah. See, so he's way ahead of me. But I mean, it, and, and that is not a good trend. Uh, it is not a good trend when, when I tell people I enjoy, that's not the right word. Um, I, I deem it a privilege to go to the Hill to testify. And people say, you're crazy. And I said, no, I'm not. There is no national discourse on aeronautics and space and the like. And so the only thing that a NASA administrator, somebody like Mike and me can do to get to the general public, to get to the world, is to go through the gruesome uh, process of congressional hearings. Because everybody pays attention when the NASA administrator goes to the Hill and testifies. And we get all these phone calls and I know it was no different from Mike, people saying, boy, I, I really feel sorry for you. It was, I, was, I, I got angry to see what was going on. I said, look, uh, that's what we do. It is the only opportunity we have to tell your story. It is the only opportunity we have to try to provoke a national discourse. There, there needs to be a national discourse on aviation and aeronautics, just as there needs to be a national discourse on human spaceflight. If there's not, then we'll continue to hear from the onesies and twosies, the, the, the voices, the very vocal voices, you know, that, that have things that they want done, and, and we don't get to the important things for the nation, so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, my name is Bob Windhorst from uh, NASA Ames Research Center, and uh, I'm a researcher in airport surface traffic management. Yeah. And we think we have some really uh, great ideas on how we can uh, save fuel and emissions uh, with traffic on the airport surface. And um, what I wanted to ask you today was, uh, would you care to comment about um, Marion Blakey yesterday? She, she talked about how sequestration may um, affect the FAA's ability to um, 
invest in next-gen technologies that may include some of the stuff that we're doing on the airport surface. Yeah. Um, how would you see NASA uh, maybe assisting or supporting the FAA in some of, some of those areas? I think the work that we have been doing and continue to do is an example of how we're trying to support. I mentioned the fact that we have now transferred three packages, three technology packages. Much of probably you worked on them at Ames because when I go to Langley and I go to Ames, I have an opportunity to sit in a simulator or to watch what you all are doing, whether it's with uh, constant descent uh, software or algorithms or whether it's in something else. And there is really, really good work going on. I can go to Ames and I can see real airline pilots, real air traffic controllers from the FAA uh, working with software engineers designing uh, air traffic management software that's going to help us to speed people from point A to point B and get around some of these environmental phenomena that, that was mentioned earlier that tend to hinder our ability to go from point A to point B. I don't know that anybody else, any other organization in the world is doing that. Uh, you know, we're not talking about a simulated pilot. We're talking about a real uh, pilot from an American airline who has taken an, an American airline. I have to be careful this morning, okay? Uh, an American air carrier, um, you know, who has been allowed to take time to come and help us with research. Those things are invaluable. Um, you know, I cannot, I, I can say one thing about sequester. It is bad, um, really bad. And it will get worse. People need to understand we're not talking about a year. We're talking about a 10-year plan that was never supposed to occur. It, was, it is so bad. It was intended to be so bad that, that national leaders would never allow it to happen. You heard everybody from the president to congressman saying, hey, don't worry about it. Sequester will not occur. Uh, and guess what? It occurred. And we're in it. Uh, we are, we're spending, NASA's presently spending about $16.8 billion a year against a proposal from the president of 17.7. .7. And we, you know, the president has requested level funding forever and ever at 17.7. .7. That's not a lot, but that's, we can live with that. Uh, if we stay under sequester come the 1st of January when the next year kicks in, we go down another 5%. So we're now at 16.1. Uh, at 16.1, that's, that's bad. That's really bad for NASA and the programs we have. We have been fortunate in that we're trying to, to stabilize aeronautics, so you know, my preference would be that we not bother aeronautics right now, but that's tough because I, the NASA administrator has very defined limits as to what we can do with money. I can move so much in and so much out of an account, but, but, but those are very strict laws. They're not they're not just uh, you know, ideas that somebody had. And so for me to, to protect aeronautics, it sometimes means I've got to either transfer more money in than I have the, the legal authority to do. Uh, and so I'll have to go to, you know, we'll have to go to Congress and talk about that. And so when I say it's our job to help educate people on the importance of what we do, um, that's kind of what I meant. You know, the, the fact that whether it's hypersonics research, rotary wing research, low boom research, because I do believe that um, we should be flying over land supersonically. We can do that. You know, we've looked, we've seen through our low boom research that's been going on out at Dryden, we can change the shape of an airfoil. You can't, you can't pro prevent a sonic boom. That's just, that's physics, okay? But where it goes, where that energy goes, you can, you can, in, you can influence. And that's what we're working on in the low boom research. So that's something that's very valuable. We would love to help Aircraft companies build supersonic transports, supersonic uh, cargo planes and the like. We'd also, and we continue to do our work in the, in the area of UASs, uh, unmanned aerial systems. Um, you know, getting cargo from place to place in an unmanned system is going to be incredibly valuable to this nation, whether it's for national security, for commerce, or whatever. Uh, and we can do that. We're doing it and demonstrating it, but, but we've got to keep, we have to keep the uh, the pressure on, if you will, and we have to be consistent in the testing that we do. We can't stop and start. Uh, our industry is one that when you take a break, you take a break, and you can't come right back in, you know, turn the lights out and come back in two or three years later and turn the lights back on. Everything's gone. Uh, you know, the expertise, uh, the tooling, all that kind of stuff. We don't, we don't take a break, leave everything in place, leave the people in hibernation, and then come back. So, we need to explain that more to national leaders and to, and to other people. The, the critical importance of what we do, 
the critical importance of stability in what we do and, and, in, and in conducting the research that we do. We lead the world right now. But if you look at the statistics, uh, you know, it's like the tortoise and the hare. Uh, we're sort of the hare. Uh, there are other nations that are sort of like the tortoise. And they're just pouring money into training people to do the kinds of research that people have come here to do since time began. And, and over time, the hare will be overtaken. So, um, and and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be an alarmist there or anything. We just need to pay attention to this kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the work that you do out there. It's always fun to come out and watch you guys. Out on the, on the, the left coast. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, John Langford at Aurora. Yeah, um, thank you very much for being here today. It means a lot to all of us to, to, uh, to have the administrator come to an event like this. Um, my question has to do with uh, flight test research. The, uh, the last activity that Neil Armstrong did in his long and distinguished career was to play a major role on a National Academy panel looking at flight test and how we could uh, revitalize that as part of the national effort. I wonder if you could comment for us on what NASA is doing to implement the results of the National Academy report and what we in the audience here today could do to help you um, implement that and revitalize flight test. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a real quick shot at it, which will be inadequate. And I'm going to ask you all to grab J1 or Tom after this session because they can tell you the details about it. I mean, they've been after me for four years. Uh, you know, we want to build some airplanes. We want to build some X planes. Um, but that requires either significant additional funding for NASA or partnerships with industry, as we did on the X 48, for example, and as we've done in other places. Um, I, I will give you an example to look at. And I know some of you don't pay any attention to stuff that, that happens in space. Um, NASA's use of Space Act agreements. Um, you know, that, that's, that's not a bad way to do business. Uh, the partnership between industry and NASA in Space Act agreements where we are investors. Uh, we turn you loose for all intents and purposes for a period of time. We try to work with you and help you understand what our requirements are going to be. And, you know, um, I think if you look at the way that we're doing commercial crew development right now, the way that we did uh, commercial cargo development, there are good lessons to be learned there. Um, and so we shouldn't just say, oh, that was a fad and now that's gone. That, that was a very good example of a way that we should be working much better with industry. And, um, and I think there is something to be said when Congress all of a sudden becomes very, very interested in Space Act agreements and, and wants to know what you're doing and, and, and how do they stop you from doing those. Uh, there, is a, there is a message there, um, okay? So um, I, I think there are examples of ways that we have done before that we could collaborate in the field of aeronautics, um, where we become an investor in the work that's being done. And we've done that in the past and we'll continue to do it in the future. Anything else? I, you all have been great and uh, thanks, yes. Uh, I think in many areas of our society, we're in this stage between human operators and fully trusted robots. And I'd be interested in, in your view as a pilot especially, mm -hmm. and looking at all the technology that we have in front of us, uh, how you think that's going to play out over time, and how do we come to grips with the human interaction between the human operator and the the high degree of automation that we're seeing in our systems. Today. I think if you want a great example of how we're dealing with that and how we're trying to promote uh, a better understanding of human robotic interaction, look at the International Space Station and look at, look at the collaborative efforts between um, uh, Robonaut 2, R2, that is on station today and the human crew. Uh, much of the effort with R2 is just trying to make sure that we have procedures in place and policies in place that enable humans to operate around robotic systems safely and that enable, robot, enable us to get the maximum efficiency out of a robotic system without it being a risk to a human. Um, we've got another robot on the outside that does stuff right now in, in what we call our um, uh, remote 
maintenance system where we're trying to look at satellite repair and, and refurbishment done robotically. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a robot that's on the outside, moves up and down the trusses on the International Space Station. It now can remove electrical cables and can remove covers and we're getting ready to step into the next stage where we're going to demonstrate autonomous refueling uh, with, you know, of, of a tank or of a system uh, using, doing it robotically. Um, if you want to go to an extreme, the Japanese just sent uh, Kibonot. No, I, I forget the name. It, it's going, it, it went up on the last uh, HTV last week and it's a small robot. Uh, that is going to interact with uh, Koichi Nakata when he gets there in November. And it, it is, it's a semi-small midget humanoid robot that will communicate with him, will, ex will carry on conversation, will recognize his voice, recognize things that he says. That'll be recorded and then transmitted to the ground. You know, the Japanese spend a lot of time looking at the human side of things. Most of the Japanese astronauts in their spare time, in addition to working out, uh, they do art or they do prose. They, they spend time working on the, the human side of stuff. Uh, Sandy can tell you some of the stuff she did when, when there. I don't have any idea because I'm a, I'm a short-term guy. I, I did camping trips. Uh, and so I, I sort of envy those who go and live and work in space today because I, I think the things we're finding are absolutely incredible. But we're working very diligently to put humans and robotic systems together collaboratively. I mentioned UAS for uh, commercial cargo. The Marine Corps right now is really, really, really pushing uh, for UAS cargo. And, and we've done a number of demonstrations where, where that works. I'm really proud to say my son is a convert. Uh, I mentioned him earlier. He's, he's the commander of uh, VMU-2 in Cherry Point, North Carolina. VMU-2 has UAS systems. They don't have any airplanes. He's a, a whizzle, a backseater in F-18s, and he loves it. Uh, you know, he, he finds it very exciting as we try to migrate some of the systems, whether they're uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance systems, migrate them from, from human space, uh, human aircraft to robotic ones, where you put the human at risk less, uh, and sometimes you get much more efficient operation out of them. So we're working diligently to try to integrate the human and the, and the robot. And FedEx yeah. and UPS and ultimately commercial aircraft? Yeah. I, people chuckle sometimes. I am one who, anytime I get on an airplane, it never fails. I walk on an airplane, I'm looking for marine pilots, really. And so I walk on the airplane and I look to the cockpit and I see who's in there and I, I carry on a conver very brief conversation because I don't want to hold up the line. But I ask them, you know, where'd you come from and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I always feel a lot more comfortable when there's a military pilot up there. Uh, particularly if it's a Navy or a Marine Corps pilot, then I feel real comfortable because I know we're going to have a really, really smooth landing because they're not trying to demonstrate, you know, that they know how to do this kind of stuff like the Air Force guys. In the Air <laughs> um, that's a joke. Okay. But in my lifetime, and I would not be surprised if not in the next maybe 10 years, uh, I walk on an airplane and I look to the left and, the, you know, the door may be open, there will be no one there. There won't be a crew in there because it'll be a remotely, it'll be a, a robotically piloted aircraft. Uh, if you look at some of the things we're doing now that make it possible for UASs and, and human airplanes to fly together, one of the aspects of, of next gen is, um, uh, is the ability to have airplanes talk to each other and uh, know where they are. An airplane today, if it's, a, if it's appropriately equipped with ADS-B, and Marion may have talked about this a little bit, but Mike can talk about it a lot. Um, if the airplanes are, are, are appropriately equipped, you know, my airplane over here with no pilot in it uh, can tell where all of its hundred or so neighbors are. And it sends out a signal and says, okay, I'm on my way to SFO. I'm on my way to San Francisco International. Who else is going that way? And 50 of those airplanes send a signal back that says, hey, we're all going to San Francisco International. And this airplane says, okay, by my calculation, I'm out in front of all of you, so follow me. And then over the course of the flight, whether it's out of Dulles and Memphis and Atlanta and everywhere else, over the four or five hour period of time, those airplanes maneuver themselves to get in line they get to the approach gate at San Francisco International at 37,000 feet or flight level 370, 
and the lead guy says, okay, it's been nice knowing you guys, I'm on my way down, and starts down, pilot takes over, and a constant descent, does not do any intermediate level offs, uh, does the approach, and everybody's happy. The gate's clear, because the ground systems that the young man from Ames talked about, you know, managed to get everybody in and out of their gate on time, that's coming. And it's coming because of some of the work that you all do and that we're doing in NASA Aeronautics. And that's, that's exciting stuff. Uh, that's when I, when I talk about making it something that's impactful to the average man and woman on the street, uh, they notice that. They will notice it. I came in yesterday, great flight out, long flight from Dulles. But we landed ahead of time. The pilot was really proud. You know, we got you here one more time uh, early. And I noticed as we're taxiing toward Riverside, <laughs> that um, something's not right. You know, we're here early and all that stuff. I'll bet you the gate's clobbered. And sure enough, we get down to El Segundo or whatever it is that goes under the runway and we turn left and sat. And the next thing, the pilot is apologizing because we're now late. And all the people going to Honolulu should run. They want everybody else to stay in place because the people going to Honolulu need to run. They're holding the plane at the gate. So we went from people at Honolulu being able to get a beer or something, you know, before they got on the airplane to now running to get there. We can do better. And I, I think that's the kind of stuff we're talking about next gen. So thank you all very much. You've been great. And thanks for letting me come out. <laughs>